Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in this episode we're going to be tearing down some old video equipment. Like, really old. Like, 50 years old. Let's get into it. I'm guessing most people are reasonably familiar with video cameras as a concept. I know everyone depends on camera phones these days, which has just got the storage and the camera in a single unit. But I'm guessing most people are familiar with the idea of like a older video camera from let's say the 90s, like the Sony we tore down a while back, or perhaps bigger broadcast equipment, you know, the sort of big sat on your shoulder job. But think about what came before then. I mean, I've got a couple of wonderful examples here of very old kit, and these are beautiful examples from way back in history. And this one is so old, it's clockwork. And that'll probably give you an idea of what overcranking film actually means when you're trying to go for high speed or slow motion video. This thing's gorgeous with the different lenses it's got and it takes actual rolls of film. Don't panic, this is dead old expired film with nothing on it, don't worry. But you can see as it goes through from spool to spool pulling each film past, it's wonderful. Impractical, expensive, but wonderful. Fast forward a bit, and this is an example of a camera that took Super 8 cartridges. It's still film, but it was in a bit more of a self-contained, easier to manage cartridge. Don't forget that Clem has also done a video making a drop-in electronic digital replacement for these. Go check out his video. It's really interesting. He originally did it using a Pi Zero and then upgraded to Compute Module 4, I think. He's done two versions of it. Go check it out. This one actually have batteries that uh, progress the film forward at a much more manageable length. You've got a bit of uh, zoom and focus, but again, just beautiful artifacts. The uh, actual wood veneer, which sadly over here is starting to peel in the corner, but you just don't get that on modern gadgets. But we didn't go straight from film cameras that were self-contained to electronic cameras that were self-contained. There was an intermediate step. And that's where this comes in. This rather light and portable piece of equipment was supposed to be carried with you as an electronic video recorder. Now it comes in this fetching faux leather case where unfortunately a load of uh, the zinc teeth on the zip corroded and basically fell apart on me. So the zip is dead. So this is the Sony-matic portable video recorder and I love the aesthetic, the brushed with the polished, with the red, the crew. It's awesome. And also the age of this 1970 puts this well ahead of other electronic video formats for the home. And the way it's supposed to work is quite revealing. So you've got battery power, obviously it's supposed to be on the go, earphone and microphone. Also you've got the transport controls, which are these wonderful physical switches, albeit these days they feel a bit chunky. Uh, and the record slider, which you have to pull over and put into forward or play before it will lock in. Around one side, you've got the external power. You've got a reasonably standard connector that uh, the camera would plug into. That also provided power to the camera. So you still had this separate camera module that you would hold. And it generally looked a bit like the shin on the, the Super 8, the kind of pistol type camera just had a lead coming out the bottom which fed into this. Uh, you've got a switch that goes between camera and TV for playback and you've got a tracking wheel, a manual tracking wheel. Well, it's a little bit of a shame that my one's lost its uh, label from up here. Never mind. Don't know if this works actually. It obviously didn't come with a working battery and uh, I haven't had the guts to power it up with an external power supply yet. Let's get this open and show you how it would have worked. So we have the instructions here on how to clean the head and how to wind the tape. So this is the one of the very few examples of reel-to-reel -reel videotape. So you get these, what are they, 
five inch spools of half inch tape. Your feed comes in here, gets wound around as these instructions say down here. Round, this is the record head, round through the caps on the pinch wheel, almost like every other sort of player, and back up onto this pickup spool, which was probably supplied with the machine. And at the end, you would obviously wind that back onto the supply spool to be kept and recorded. Just, it's wonderful. The belts look like they're in, uh, not perfect, but I've seen worse condition. And these actually only run the minute counter, so it's not too bad anyway. No one really cares if your minute counter slips. But with the age that this is, 1970, I was really intrigued to see what style and what quality the electronics inside were. And there's only one way we're going to find out. Let's just have a quick look. The screws on the underside as well. <laughs> Okay, that is the battery plug, the battery cover. I have no idea what sort of battery pack this was. Absolutely none. I'm guessing possibly lead acid, big enough for it. 12.6 watts without camera. So the camera had a separate power draw and there was an RF module which could slot in here, which just had this little RF outlet on the bottom, which was obviously an optional upgrade. Certainly one that this one doesn't have. Well, since it's here and screaming at us, let's take this cover off the read right head. Oh, oh, that's cool. So this is still a helical scan. You remember when we have done other tapes, we've talked about how they achieve density by presenting a strip of tape and recording stripes of data diagonally across it. So the tape feed rate doesn't have to be enormous to get the data read rate off of that tape. Now, mostly that's achieved by moving the tape past a fully rotating read write drum, but this doesn't. This drum stays static. Only the read right heads ever so slightly touch the tape as it goes past the transport. So you can see this horizontal slit across here as the uh, drum spins inside here. Read right heads just pass over there and the tape follows this slightly lip here to give you that helictical scan. Okay, so we just loosened off this mechanism this <laughs> part and it's just got these four little brushes coming from two different directions which appear to be paralleled up each of which touches two copper or maybe even gold plated rings that go around the center of this spindle. So that's how they're transferring all the data signals to those read right heads. And I would guess it's going to be two signals left, two signals right as it rotates. So it'll be top and bottom pairs or something along those lines. <laughs> so that belt on that motor, obviously the uh, read right head. Now, I think Understandably, if I can, I'd like to leave as much as the mechanical structure complete because have you seen all these little linkages, D-rings, springs? I'm going to lose an eyeball without question, but I do love how all these linkages work together. There's the record button, which only stays in place when you press forward as well. There we go. Oh yes. Okay, well the battery pack goes on to a barrel jack, which is found down there. Nicely black and red. It looks like the center pin is ground. Ooh, you can see the condition of some of these belts though. They do not look happy. Let's see if this uh, nice little plastic cover that clearly is only there to protect the battery from the circuitry beneath. Ooh, crusty vintage capped on tape. Okay, see that board edge connects now. So it's only one, two, three, four, five, six pin and connected to it we only have one, two, three, four, five, five pins. So I'm guessing ground composite audio and audio ground, maybe. A lot of potentiometers down here. That must be a lot of control over something. Probably a lot of video control. All right. I'm going to come around here because I can see this board has got a connect a plug on it. I feel like we have a chance of getting this off and actually seeing what it does. Okay, so we've got a linear regulator. 
some capacitors. So this is like a power conversion board. Interesting, there's a lot of unpopulated equipment on this board. There was a fuse as well. So as I move the uh, transport controls, you can see this, these two linkages moving all sorts of contacts and switches. So what I haven't spotted is this roller here. So that should pinch onto this roller when it's in the play position, but it doesn't. I think this roller must have... Maybe it's a linkage that's not happy, actually. That roller has the tape pushed in between it there. And this picks up the speed from this roller. You can see that that's linked to the drum, which means you're always synchronized with the number of revolutions per head to the feed through rate. It doesn't matter if your battery's going like slow. Well, it does. But the theory goes that every revolution here is still gonna be the same corresponding number of revolutions here. Okay, I'm gonna go remove this board next because I don't know where else to go, frankly. Right, having stripped that screw head, I've just spent 10 minutes turning the posi into a slot um, with a diamond bit and a Dremel. Let's see if a nice slotted bit will do the trick. Yes, sorry I damaged a screw. Oh wow, passives are us, and soldered connections are us. Is this entire thing just passives? <laughs> I'd quite like to get that pulley out, but it's got a roll pin installed in it, so I don't know how I'd go about that. It's interesting that on any given board, there's a mixture of non-ferrous and metallic washers, depending on how whether it should be grounded to the chassis or not. Ah, oh, look, it's another one of those weird little cage nutty type things, which is very useful because otherwise that board would not be coming out. But again, look, just passives. Even inside this RF shielding, there's nothing but passives. I'm not familiar with whatever this part is. It's very much like what we saw on the other side um, on that sort of the mechanical interface board. We had those, the, the linkages from the mechanical systems actually pushing and pulling on the end of one of these. If you look, it just pulls out plastic from one end, but on the bottom side, a whole row of, trace of pins, like it's doing a very big swap over, like the biggest throw switch you've ever seen. Okay, I have to plug on the bottom of that board, which plugged into that interface. Okay, I don't know if you can see this little pin down here. There's another one corresponding just there. And these are related to the mechanical linkages on the other side, but that is what pulls that to one side. And similarly, that one will be connected to one just here. So they are just very big banks of switches. And there is one single IC that I can see on the bottom here. Sony 506A 6K001. I wonder what that is. Fantastically, you can still get hold of the service manual for these online. Um, and from that, I can tell you a little bit more. So this is the record modulator um, PCB. And wonderfully, they will tell you what shape waveform you should expect if you probe this with an oscilloscope. Uh, they call them test points. They don't actually mean test points like you and I in a modern sense would think test points. They mean literally poke it onto parts of the PCB. So the next board is this board, which is the demodulator. We have down here the audio handling board, the regulator board, which is this little fella, does what it says really. Even talks you through the steps you need to uh, adjust the potentiometers to calibrate all of these boards. Weirdly, this one's just called the Z printed circuit board. I don't feel like that helps me out at all <laughs> as to what it actually does. You've got this main board up here. So this board is the servo control board. Now, we've seen that a lot with some of the more modern stuff, particularly the Philips N1700. Um, this will control the motor speeds, so there is some kind of feedback um, electronically to make that work. 
And again, they give you all the test points on the board and show you where to probe it to get what signal out you should expect. So it'd be very comprehensive debugging to be able to complete on this. There you go. Those are the boards. Right. To get this apart any further, is going to need a soldering iron and some more brutal tools to get the roll pins out, things like that. If we take that next step, that is basically a guarantee that this is never going to be put back together again, ever. I don't know which way I want to go. I want to hear what you think. Head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Let me know if you would like to see this put back together and we'll try and get it running, or whether you would like to see it in it, all its component glory. I think the 1970s, the fact that this was almost entirely passives and it's looking very good for it. There's a chance it could work. There's a chance it could let the smoke out instantly. Have your say and I'll see you on the next video where we will do whatever you ask me to do with it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.